Good evening. On behalf of Loma Linda University School of Medicine, Dr. Penny Dirksen Hughes, and I would like to welcome you to our dedication program this evening. We especially want to welcome parents, family members, and friends of our first year class members, but also our faculty, staff, alumni, and community members. Loma Linda University School of Medicine held its first dedication service for its medical students in 1989. The idea for the dedication came from students who organized the first service and began the custom of presenting each student with a Bible engraved with the school's emblem. The first Family Day was held the next year in 1990. Subsequently, Family Day and the freshman dedication service have been a valued uh, tradition. In keeping with this tradition, tonight we dedicate both our graduate and our medical students. This is the 10th year in which the graduate students have participated in the ceremony and the ninth time they have committed to their calling with an oath that it was administered earlier this morning at the graduate award ceremony. When you think about it, God has given us as humans the ability to speak truth and knowledge as well as to apply it. These two perspectives of service are nicely illustrated by scientists pursuing scientific and medical truth and the clinicians using the science, science's discoveries in a healing ministry. For this reason, it is appropriate this evening to de de dedicate both our future research scientists as well as our future clinicians to serving mankind. As you can imagine, our students have come to us from a variety of backgrounds and experiences, and we would like to share some of that with you. In the Doctor of Medicine program, we have 168 first-year students chosen from an applicant pool of 6,318. 53% of them are male, 47% female. Their average age is 23 and a half years. While they have undergraduate majors ranging from engineering to international studies, 86% of them have a major in a science field. They represent 47 colleges and universities come from 23 states and five countries. Those countries are Canada, Ecuador, Russia, South Korea, and Trinidad and Tobago. Tonight, they are being dedicated to Christian medical service. These students come to us already having a rich history of involvement in service activities that would take all evening to describe. They've been active in their churches and civic organizations in a variety of roles. They've served here in this country and abroad in over 40 countries, from Belize to Zambia. The graduate programs in the basic and biological sciences have a combined enrollment of approximately 90 students, of whom a number are combined degree candidates. Our entering class has 15 students. Graduate students are engaged in a number of different research areas, including cancer research, development in prenatal biology, microbial pathogenesis, radiobiology, neuroscience, and drug design. Like the medical students, they are ethnically diverse with origins in many different countries, including Antigua, Austria, Brazil, Canada, China, Colombia, Cameroon, Ecuador, Ethiopia, Guyana, Hungary, India, Indonesia, Jamaica, Kenya, Korea, Lebanon, Malaysia, Mexico, Nepal, Nigeria, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, Thailand, and Trinidad and Tobago, and Uganda. Graduate students are involved in service. One area of current focus is working through other student associations on campus to assist families in the underserved areas of San Bernardino. At this time, Don Latour, one of our freshman medical students, will have the invocation. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your leading in our lives in the past. Um, many of us have prayed to be here studying medicine, and we're so excited about the opportunities that we have. We're thankful this evening that our parents and our families can share this moment with us. We ask your spirit would guide in this service, um, that you would lead us, that you would continue to bless us going forward. Lord, help us to see that now that we are gifted with um, studying in, in such a wonderful institution, that now it is our responsibility to present our lives as a living sacrifice, as is our 
reasonable service. We're so thankful for your blessings, and we ask this evening that you would come, and may this worship be acceptable in your eyes. In your name I pray, amen. Luke 4, 14 to 21. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, 
and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Randy Roberts. Dr. Roberts spent much of his early life in Latin America as he was born in South America to missionary parents. He graduated from Southwestern Adventist University in Keene, Texas, and uh, pastored there before going to Andrews University. In 1987, he began work here as a chaplain at Loma Linda University Medical Center, where for over seven years he provided patient and staff support, spiritual care, and counseling. He was instrumental in establishing and leading the Medical Center's grief recovery program, and he has a lot of insight um, for all of us in healthcare on how to interact uh, with people who are uh, both in pain and in crisis. Uh, he taught full-time here for a while at the School of Religion, and in September of 2000 began senior pastor duties here at the Loma Linda University Church. He has served as vice president for spiritual life and mission here at Loma Linda University. Um, he's spoken to many and um, varied audiences. He's um, uh, written um, both articles and books and has a, a lot of of interesting and um, wonderful things that he's shared. He is married to Anita Roberts, who works for the Southeastern California Conference in the areas of prayers ministry and pastoral spouse support ministries, and as she's working on her master's in pastoral ministry. Um, they have a son who is a pastor um, who is married to an alum from the School of Medicine who's doing her OBGYN residency right now, and a daughter and son-in-law who are at Andrews University. I think when all said and done, um, you uh, see a lot of Dr. Robert's talents and experience. One of the things that I personally have appreciated is his wonderful ability to tell a story and to tell a story that delivers a message. So we're excited that he's here today, and we welcome you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you so much to Dean Thomas for the privilege of being with you here this evening at this most important moment in your educational journey. I soaked in the feelings of excitement from you as you gathered in this place this evening and just thought this is one more step in the process. It was about a year ago, we had the privilege of being in the country of Israel we were leading a group through Israel and Egypt and visiting some of the places that are so meaningful historically and so sacred to our faith. Our land operator and tour guide was an Israeli gentleman named Ezer. Ezer literally means helper in Hebrew, and that's exactly what Ezer is. Ezer's a big Israeli. He's about maybe six foot six inches tall. And he has a large presence. He kind of sucks the oxygen out of every room he walks into. A great tour operator and land guide. Ezra runs a very tight ship. And he does so with a soft hand. He announces right at the beginning of the tour, We love you, but we will leave you. He tells us the time we're leaving, and that's usually when we pull out. So we had just seen Masada. And rather than ride the cable car down, a friend and I said, let's, let's run down the path. And so we ran down the path. We got down there only to discover our bus was gone. And I thought, have mercy. If he leaves one of the leaders, he'll leave anyone. So we kind of looked at each other thinking, what are we going to do next? And finally my phone rang and I answered and it was Ezra. 
And it was quintessential Ezra. He said to me, Randy, everything is great. Life is beautiful. Now, where are you? (laughs) That's Ezra. Thus it was of great interest to me when we came to Nazareth. Nazareth, that city of such important history. We had ridden the bus up to a hill, a rather large hill, outside the city of Nazareth, and we had gone out to the escarpment slash cliff near which the city is built. It's a place that becomes very important in the story of Jesus of Nazareth in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. But we were standing there, and it's a bit like this stage. There's a place where everybody can stand, and then you can kind of move off, and there's some rocks that lead out, and then suddenly the escarpment slash cliff drops hundreds of feet down to the floor of the Esdraelon Valley. People were standing there getting their pictures taken, and Ezra said to me, Randy, come over here, let's get a picture taken. So I went over and stood by him and felt like his little boy as he put his arm around me. They took a couple of pictures, and then he said to me, now... Look visionary. And I'm like, what? He says, look visionary. And I'm like, how do you look visionary? He says, just look visionary. Well, I don't know how to look visionary. Well, look that way and point. So I said, okay. So I turned and looked that way and pointed. And he stood beside me and they took a picture, which I'd like to show you this evening. If you look up at the screen. That's Ezra. As you can tell, he's, uh, he's standing below me and yet towering above me. And that's me looking visionary on the hill, the cliff beside Nazareth. I've looked at that picture a number of times and thought, that's probably a good place to look visionary because that's exactly what Jesus did in Nazareth. He came to Nazareth and delivered his inaugural address. He was founding his kingdom, the kingdom of God, in the Nazareth synagogue, and he was laying out his agenda for that kingdom. That agenda was so visionary that it can affect and change not just your medical school career, but your practice of medicine throughout the rest of your lives. Because buried in this inaugural address are key principles that we put into play when we further the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, I have to give you just a bit of location for where this is found. It's found in Luke's Gospel. Remember that the Gospels are not chronologies, just giving you an outline like a diary, this happened this day and this happened the next day and this happened on the third day. The Gospels are theologies. They're painting a picture of who Jesus was and is. In fact, it has been said that Matthew tells us what Jesus taught because it focuses so much on some of his larger segments of teaching. That Mark tells us what Jesus wrought because if you follow Mark, it's always immediately here, immediately there, and immediately in the next place, and you're out of breath by chapter 2. John, it is said, is what Jesus thought because you see his heart more clearly in John than maybe any of the other Gospels. And Luke, this Gospel here, tells us whom Jesus sought. If you read the Gospel of Luke, you see who he has come after. In fact, were it not for the Gospel of Luke, we would have no Good Samaritan statue because we would have no Good Samaritan story. If it weren't for the Gospel of Luke, we would not see that prodigal son staggering down the lane toward home. If it were not for the Gospel of Luke, we would not see that penitent thief wrenching his body to the side, trying to get a glimpse of this itinerant rabbi hanging beside him to hear his words, I guarantee you, you'll be with me in my kingdom. Because Luke tells us whom Jesus sought, who he was after. And it just could be many of the very same people you will be seeking throughout the coming decades of your lives. So there he was in the Nazareth synagogue looking visionary. And not just looking it, but being visionary. 
Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 14, says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went up into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. The way a synagogue service unfolded was that whomever had been asked to speak for the day was given the scroll. That person stood to read the scroll out of respect for the scripture. And then once the scroll had been read and folded up, the person sat down to teach as a visible indication that I stand under the authority of the word that has just been read. So when Jesus finishes and sits down and the eyes of all are focused on him, they're waiting to hear what he has to say. He says something very simple. Today, right here in this synagogue, this scripture is fulfilled. And it's as though an electric current goes through the crowd. Because this was a messianic passage. This was understood to be what would be true when the Messiah arrived. And so when Jesus says, today it's fulfilled, he is proclaiming that the kingdom has arrived. This will be the inaugural address. You notice what happens to the people. They're poking each other in the ribs. They're saying, this is unbelievable. Listen to what he's saying. I mean, isn't that Joseph? Is that the kid that grew up down the street? Yeah, we have a bedside table he made. We have a dining room table, best table we've ever seen. Is that him? Yeah, that's him. How can that be? And the text says they all spoke well of him. It's a good day for a preacher when they all speak well of you. This is a good day for Jesus. And then you notice the content of what he's saying. Sight to the blind, freedom for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Isn't that what you're going to do? You may not do it from a pulpit or a platform, or you may. That may become a part of your mission, but it could be that your pulpit and your platform will be at the bedside of one patient who is looking to you, waiting to hear your word. What will you share what will you tell me? How will it affect my life? When you deliver bad news, will you leave it with a ray of hope? When you hear their tear-filled and fear-filled confession, will you hear it with mercy? When they realize they've come to the end of the cancer road, will they detect in you maybe a road on the other side? Jesus came, if I could summarize this, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to declare that the Lord is with you. I saw it, one of my favorite moments when I worked as a chaplain. You'll have to forgive me if I've shared it with you. 
I've often thought of it over the years, and when I do, I share it. I was on call that night. Called by a surgeon, things had gone wrong. Will you gather the family? Gather them in the family room, 7th floor, 1 a.m. When the chaplain comes to see you at 1 a.m., that's not a good sign. So I could feel the tension within them as I shepherded them, in, shepherded them into the room. The surgeon came along with his resident. They stood immediately, fear on their faces, waiting to hear what he said. His words were kind, but to the point. I'm very sorry to tell you, very sorry, that things went wrong on the table and he did not survive. There was, as you might expect, an outcry of emotion. And the surgeon waited. After what to me seemed like very long moments, things subsided just a bit. He invited them to sit around a table. He took out a piece of paper and he began to sketch. Here's what was wrong. Here's what we were trying to do. Here's what further went wrong. It was un I could understand it. It was understandable to a layperson. They asked questions. He answered. He pulled a little child, a grandchild, close by and said, Do you understand what happened to Grandpa? And tearfully, the child said, I think so. The surgeon said to them, I've asked the chaplain to be here because after I leave, you'll have questions. You'll not know what to do next, what to do tomorrow, how to get through the day. First of all, I want you to make an appointment in my office a couple of weeks from now because by then your heads will be more clear and you'll have more questions. And the chaplain can guide you through the coming steps that have to be taken. And then he said, I, I need to go now, but would you like me to? I don't have to, but would you like me to pray with you? And they said, yes. And he prayed and shook hands and hugged and left. And I was profoundly struck that that family, gathered in grief, spent the next few moments talking not about their loss, but about how blessed they were to have that surgeon. Now we don't have to wonder whether or not everything was done. And I wanted to look out the doorway down the hallway hoping that maybe he had called 12 residents to follow him because he was on the business of this kingdom, healing the brokenhearted. That's what you'll have to do. It may be at a distance. You may work in a lab in scientific research, but you will have friends, colleagues, partners, family members who will be brokenhearted. Jesus announced in the Nazareth synagogue in his inaugural address, this is my kingdom, to heal the brokenhearted. But there's a problem in that because the sermon was only half done. Luke 4, just after it says, they all spoke well of him and said, isn't this Joseph's son? Jesus continues and said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we heard you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, when there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. 
And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue, didn't we just read that a moment ago? All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked through the crowd and went on his way. That's the kind of passage a preacher pays attention to. Because halfway through the sermon, everybody's saying, Amen. By the end of the sermon, they're chanting, Kill the preacher. You pay attention. What in the world happened? Halfway through the sermon. It's your inaugural address. How did it go so wrong? Well, it went wrong on one point. His first point was, I'm here to heal the brokenhearted. And that's what he invites you to do. But his second point was, I'm here to welcome the rejected. Those who've been pushed out, those who've been told you have no place here, those to whom it's been said, this belongs to us, and we're going to guard it and keep it close. And Jesus says to this crowd, when the kingdom arrives, God will do remarkable things through ordinary people. In fact, let me give you a couple of illustrations of where God has done that. And then he gives them the illustration of two foreigners, strangers to Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise. He says, you know, when Elijah was around, there were a lot of widows in Israel. He went over to Zarephath of Sidon. When Elisha was working, There were a lot of lepers in Israel. He went to Naaman the Syrian. And they started breathing fire. How dare you? How dare you suggest that this kingdom you are establishing will welcome them? What are you talking about? It was like lighting a match to a fuse. And by the time the pulse lewd was playing, the sanctuary was being emptied of furious people pushing him to that cliff to throw him off. It still works that way. I don't know where it will happen in your life and world. I don't know where it will happen in your scientific endeavors or in your practice of medicine. But what I do know is you will come to those people. And I put that in quotation marks. I don't know who they are. I know in my own lifetime who some of them have been. I can remember... Not that long ago, a couple, three decades ago, I can remember the suspicion and the fear surrounding patients with AIDS. I can remember Dr. Harvey Elder coming to my class, being taught to sophomore medical students a religion class. And Dr. Elder, infectious disease physician, coming in and telling the stories of his interactions with, his ministry to, his care for gay patients with AIDS. It may not seem like much today. It was a great deal at that point in time. I don't know who it will be for you, but it will be someone. Someone who belongs outside the boundaries. Someone who ought not be here. Somebody whom, if we good religious folk know you're dealing with, we might just get angry enough to shove you out to a cliff and say, we're tired of you looking visionary. We'd like to toss you over the edge. And your commitment to the kingdom of God will be tested right there. 
Jesus includes a whole number of people here, broken-hearted people, captives, and prisoners. Makes me think of a colleague of mine in chaplaincy. She was here finishing her education. She was a diminutive woman, small, from a, from a Quaker background. I didn't know much about the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers, until I met Linda. But I learned a lot and came to truly respect her and her faith. Respected her because there was a depth and a centeredness about her. A commitment to the kind of people of whom Jesus here speaks. I suppose that's why she behaved as she did. There was a a baby baby up in the Peds wards, NICU, I don't remember exactly where, but in the hospital. And it was clear as they ministered and worked with and did all the science known on that baby, it was finally clear the baby would not survive. Baby's mother was in prison, was a prisoner and for good reason. And so the medical center intervened and did everything possible, asking the authorities, would it be possible, would it be possible to bring the mother here? She's the mother. Sure, she's a prisoner. She's the mother. So she could see the baby one last time, hold the baby one last time. Well, the the authorities at the medical center and Linda among them prevailed. And the state agreed. She will come accompanied by armed guard. She will come shackled. But she can come. And so they brought her. Brought her to the hospital. Took her upstairs. Took her into the room. And the guard stood outside and inside. Carefully supervising everything that happened. And that mother. That prisoner held her baby. It was right at the end. The baby was just, they didn't know for sure, hours, moments from death. But the guards were clear, she's got this much time and then we're through. The mother was heartbroken. But the moment came, they said, okay, it's time to go. She was racked with sobs, and you can only imagine the pain that she felt. Just a little longer, please. Nope, time to go. And that's when Linda, Chaplain Linda, diminutive Linda, had a kingdom surge and stepped between that mother and the guards. And in her gentle way said, we don't take dying babies from their mother's arms in this hospital because we follow Jesus even if the mother is a prisoner. And the authorities backed away. You just want to be very careful when you tangle with someone who has the kingdom inside them. And so Jesus preached in the Nazareth synagogue. And it went from, I can't believe I know this guy. He's the guy who grew up down the street. This is unbelievable. Because he came to heal the brokenhearted. It went from that to saying, Get him out of here. Take him to that cliff and throw him over the cliff. Because he said, we're going to welcome the rejected. So you're one step closer to your goal. You're being dedicated here this evening. You're going to receive Bibles that have that story right in them. You're going to have to decide. Am I a half a sermon scientist, a half a sermon doctor that can say, I know him, it's Joseph's son? Or am I a kingdom physician, a 
a kingdom scientist who is willing to stand between the baby and the law and say, we follow Jesus. I hope Jesus will give you tender hearts for the broken. I pray he will give you courageous hearts for the rejected. students retrieved it. Andrew Tolan. Don Latour. <clears throat> Patricia Principe. Jessica Ahn. Phoebe Chum. Annalise Lang. Alina Gruba. Layden Alfaro. Natasha Lay. Rosalind Morowski. Brianna Dismayan. Catherine Halbitter. Sydney Metacroft. Jeannie Choi. Carla Blum Johnston. Karen Prakash. Stephanie Ng. Adam Bassical. Hunter Roberts. Marissa Chang. Sean Rick Stahl. Jennifer Makowski. Braden Stanier. Jade Deschon. Michaela Carlson. Evelyn Oro Rodriguez. Noah Ford. Marcus Matthews. Serena Lynn. Andrew Comfort. Janine Kwan. Jefferson Richards. Nicole Sandoval. Spencer Hart. Gabriella Wichasano. Jacob Carlson. Dave Malari. Matthew Shedd. Haley Joel. Emilia Ramirez. Jalen Bautista. Lauren Bathon. Megan Baranda. Karen Bathon. Rachel Guest. Ashley Howard. Silas Griffin. Reese Stutzman. Jaffe Amoa. Brian Ferguson. Christina Estrada. Chelsea Kent. Renee Mitchell. Brenda Rodriguez. Rachel Scales. Haley Butler. Bailey Holmes. Bradley Snow. 
Alice Lee. Joseph Mayer. Adrian Osias. Diego Del Carpio. Amanda Escano. Hector Moss. Vance Gentry. Matthew Wilson. Brandon Dabrowski. Brian Urbina. Andrew Cuevas. Monica Fukuda. Caleb McKinney. Esther Gowley. Carter Ware. Benjamin Rivera. Hunter Zaid. Jonathan Specht. Michael Paul Reimer. Jonathan Thomas. Michael Barecki. Thomas Riggs. Jenna Lee. Jonathan M. Lindsey Kim. Caitlin Juno. Lindsey Hunt. Madeline Costella Chin. Thomas Barecki. Helena Herber. Gavin Skio. Sydney Drury. Madison Carter. Stacy Yoon. Timothy Ahn. Kyle Shaw. Nathaniel Siri Kareja. Hannah Chi. Joanne Lynn Johnson. Christopher Gates. Nathaniel Huang. Alana Auskerson. Robert Nihara. Naria Gabrieloff. Andrew Castor. David Scow. Richard Ong. Andrew Peverini. John Jung. Adam Hagley and Alexander Chang. We would like to invite the class to come forward to say the oath. Come and take pictures. We're going to give you a few minutes to do that. A few moments. Come on up and uh, take pictures.
Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get ready. Okay, I'm going to ask you, we're going to read it in unison. So everybody for the physician's oath and the scientist's oath um, get, will get ready to go and we'll read it in unison. Before God, these things uh, I do promise in the acceptance of my sacred calling, I will dedicate my life to the furtherance of Jesus Christ's keeping and teaching ministry. I will give to my teachers the respect and gratitude which is their due. I will impart to those who follow me the knowledge and experience that I have gained. The wholeness of my patient will be my first consideration. Acting as a good steward of the resources of society and of the talents granted me, I will endeavor to reflect God's mercy and compassion by caring for the lonely, the poor, suffering and those who are dying. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. I will not use my medical knowledge contrary to the laws of humanity. I will respect the rights and decisions of my patients. I will hold in confidence all secrets committed to my keeping and practice of my calling. I will lead my life and practice my art with purity and honor abstaining from immorality myself, I will not lead others into wrongdoing. May God's kingdom, his healing power and glory be experienced by those whom I serve and may they be made known in my life in proportion as I am faithful to this love. I'm going to join you as we pray, so I'm going to come up here. Thank you. I'm going to pray and dedicate you guys as you go out as physicians, so let us pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for who you are and your love. We worship you right now and just are rejoicing for this great moment. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Just as we sang the song earlier, great is your faithfulness, and I ask you would bring to mind the moments of your faithfulness that has brought each student here today. We thank you, Lord, that we can count on you as we keep going on this journey. I thank you that you get to be with us close. You get to go right beside us as we continue to walk on this journey. And we dedicate these students, not only on their journey through medical school, through their science programs, but also as physicians who carry your ministry to others. God, we thank you that each person here is anointed today to take forth your words, your actions, to heal the brokenhearted, and to proclaim who you are, maybe through your words, but mostly through your actions, their actions. So God, we dedicate each one, dedicate each one to you. And most of all, Lord, would you just come and be near them in their hearts? and remind them of how you see them so that they may carry that, that love to all that they meet. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming tonight. You're dismissed. Enjoy. <laughs>